Welcome to a new installment on the series Germanic Languages Compared. This is a list about autumn, so vocabulary items related to autumn, as well as some fascinating etymologies related to them. I strongly encourage you to contribute in the comment section with the corrections or if you want to add to the list yourselves and uh, yeah, generally speaking, things I might have missed. Let's start and enjoy. So let's start with autumn. I think it's pretty clear which one is the odd one out here. So in Swedish Norwegian you have höst, in German you have herbst, in Dutch herbst, höst in Icelandic and so on. So the English one autumn does not share a common root with the other ones. However, the older word for autumn was actually harvest. This is the cognate for the rest of them, except for Danish, which, which uses the term after or, which literally means uh, after the year, so a later period during the year. So the older word was harvest, and it was actually used up until the late 14th century when it was gradually replaced by the word stemming from uh, Latin, autumnus. This is actually an unclear root, and um, this suggests that that there might have not been a common root for all these words after all. But the most common one, so the harvest, this root stems from a Proto-Indo-European word, most likely meaning to pick or to pluck, which makes perfect sense if you think about the main activity uh, during autumn. Harvestar would be the Germanic root. If you want, you can compare with other words such as carpo carpere from Latin meaning to gather or with the Greek uh, carpos. The next word would be wheat, which is a pretty common word, not only in Germanic languages, but generally speaking, the reconstructed old root would be Hwaitias, and it can also be found in older languages such as Old Saxon, for example, the form uh, Hweti, and in Old High German with the form Weizi. So to exemplify in modern languages, we have, for example, Weizen in German, uh, Wetter in Norwegian, Wir in Danish, Kvet in Icelandic. The Proto-Indo-European root would um, refer to something meaning resembling white or with a shade of white, perhaps shining as well, with reference not only to the plant but perhaps also to the to the meals prepared from the plant. As you can notice on this list, we do have an odd one here as well, which is the Dutch word tarwe, uh, which is actually not uh, from the same root, but from a root meaning to tear, which may refer to uh, the way we actually access the produce from this uh, plant. So to crack, the meaning to crack, you can also find in other uh, Germanic languages or dialects if you want to consider them as such, such as Limburgish or uh, West uh, Flemish. Let's have a look at leaf because it's a very interesting one. For example, love in Swedish and Norwegian. These are the two ones which are cognate with the English one. And then we have the alternative, which would be blatt in German or blir in uh, Danish or blad in Icelandic. So you can notice here two variants, two roots. So leaf also had the meaning sheet of paper and can also be found in older languages such as Old Norse in the form Lauf, Old Saxon as Lauf, or in uh, the modern, uh, in modern German as Laub, but uh, the meaning would be foliage. So it is rather a collective noun. It is not really used for only one sheet, for only one uh, leaf. The Proto-European root seems to be a verb meaning to strip off, and it can also be found with different meanings uh, in other languages. In Russian, for example, we have lob meaning forehead. In Latvian, we have luobas meaning peel. And in Lithuanian, we have luoba meaning um, bark. So at some point, they would have had this uh, shared meaning of peeling off, uh, stripping off. And then we have the second root, which would be blada in the reconstructed form. Um, again, meaning leaf or uh, sheet, but then the meaning was extended to blade as well. So blade in the sense of a flat surface of uh, a particular tool. And this would have been the Old English term, actually, in the form bled. So the older root seems to be a verb which um, would have meant to bloom or something of the sort, perhaps with um, reference to the change going on with the leaves in, uh, in autumn. So very interesting that we have uh, two roots for, uh, for this word. 
apple, as you can see, almost the same word across the Germanic languages. Uh, Eple, for example, in Swedish, Apfel in German, Epli in Icelandic, Ible in Danish, Apple in Dutch, and uh, so on. The old meaning would have been fruit in general or berry, so it didn't really have this specific meaning of a particular uh, plant. And you can find it in other languages as well, in Old Irish, in Old Church, Slavonic, and many others. However, the relationship between these words is quite uh, unclear. It's also hypothesized that it might have entered Proto-Indo-European uh, later. So that's also quite fascinating. And um, yeah, the apple from, from the Bible, so that would be the classical representation in Western art and culture. That wasn't really an apple. We actually have no clue what it would have uh, been. There are several interpretations uh, possible here. Pumpkin. This word is actually attested from the 16th century, most likely borrowed from uh, peponym in Latin, meaning a melon or a certain type of melon. But the Proto-Indo-European root would suggest a meaning such as to uh, ripen. And you can see here there are different forms. So the word related to pumpkin in English would be pumpa in Swedish, as well as uh, pompoon in uh, Dutch and pompa in um, uh, Frisian. But there are also other possibilities here. For example, German has uh, Kürbis. This would stem from a proto-West Germanic root used in reference to any kind of uh, squash or squash-like plant. And this has to do with the Latin cucurbita. It's a family of uh, plants. And then you have in uh, Norwegian kreska or in Danish kreskær. Uh, Kasker in uh, Icelandic, so it's the same word. And it's an interesting one because it contains uh, two elements here. So we have the element uh, kar, which actually has to do with these um, words from uh, German and Proto West uh, Germanic. So kurbit would be the reconstructed form, so the melon or a kind of melon, plus kres, which is grass. So the melon growing in the grass, I guess chestnut the chestnut nut it used to be spelled in two different words so literally the large nut stemming from the word castanea in latin but in english it came via old french chastain um, in the rest of the germanic languages the word is pretty much the same with the variants such as castani or castania uh, castania and so on. It is a potential borrowing from a language from Asia Minor, possibly Armenian, with um, the form uh, Kask, or at least there would have been some kind of common root here. The term grape in English actually replaced the older one, win berge from Old English, literally meaning wine, berry, a term which is still preserved by modern day Icelandic in the form vin ber, probably connected to the verb to grasp, coming from an older root, Proto Germanic, kapon, uh, meaning to hook, with reference to vine hooks, possibly. And then we have the other root for terms such as druva in Swedish, trua uh, in uh, Danish, uh, traube in German or trauf in Dutch. This would mean a cluster of plants in the reconstructed Proto-Germanic uh, form. However, there is no convincing etymology for this. The word in itself seems to have been old because we do find, for example, in Old High German, a similar term, uh, trubo. There is a Hittite word which would mean to collect, maybe related to this uh, root. However, it still remains uh, uncertain. Acorn is a tricky one. We find similar forms in Aran in Danish, Ekolon in Swedish, um, Akarn in Icelandic, or Ekornut in Norwegian. So we have the meaning mast of trees, like this very general meaning initially, and it is attested in older languages such as Old Norse, Old English, as well as um, Gothic. The relationship would have been at first to fields, generally speaking, or to fruit that you can find in the open, uh, I guess. And um, the term that has been reconstructed is uh, akras. With the passage of time, the meaning suffered a restriction just to the um, produce for swine. But then again, we have terms in Dutch and German, 
Eichel would suggest it comes from Eiche, which is an oak, and the term oak is actually a very difficult one. It does seem to be a, new, a European word, but it has no certain etymology. It may be related to a Greek word, however, the derivations are difficult in other languages. That is why uh, most linguists are actually wary of relating this term to um, other ones. The um, cognate, a potential cognate in Latin, Aesculus, is actually pretty uh, obscure and kind of high, hard to, uh, to prove. So that would be um, the problem here. Find the odd one out in this new batch. <laughs> it's obviously a squirrel because in uh, the other Germanic languages we have a different root. So for example in Norwegian Ekorn or Ikorni in Icelandic Eon in Danish Eichhörnchen in German Ekorn in Dutch. So the first component of these words may be related to the Eich root, the root for oak. And the second part of the word is actually much clearer. It would come from uh, an old root where, meaning marten or ferret or, yeah, generally speaking, this family of um, um, small animals. Uh, Aquerna would have been the term in Old English, and it is related to the Latin vivera, which would have meant ferret or something related to it. The term squirrel is actually from French, escurie, and uh, it would have in its turn come from a word from vulgar Latin, uh, scurius. And in Greek, there is a similar term, literally meaning shadow tailed. The next one, crow, is a pretty straightforward one. Kroka in Swedish, kroke in Norwegian, kra in Danish, krea, German, krai, Dutch, krauka, Icelandic, and uh, so on. So it uh, definitely stems from corvus in Latin, generally uh, defining uh, this uh, whole family of corvide, so ravens included. And the Proto Indo European root here would be to creak, so essentially imitating harsh sounds as the birds from this uh, family would do. Most intelligent birds of them all, actually. And fun fact here, Krauka or Kroka in Old Norse is also the nickname of the Queen Aslaug, one of Ragnar Lothbrok's wives, and it was her nickname until Ragnar Lothbrok found out that she was actually none other than the daughter of the famous hero Sigurd, the dragon slayer. Owl is among the easier terms on this list as well. Ugla in Swedish, Ugla in Norwegian, Ule in Danish, Aul in Dutch, Eule in German, Ugla in uh, Icelandic. And the reconstructed Proto-Germanic form would have been something similar to Uwilo, and it is most definitely, or at least, yeah, the highest likelihood would be uh, that we're dealing with an onomatopoetic word. So these are essentially the words that uh, are formed after the particular sounds, animals or uh, things utter. There are some interesting expressions with owls. Uh, two of them come to mind right now. So the first of all, the first one would be at Anna Uglur i Mossen. This is the Swedish one, but I think it stems from Danish, nevertheless. So it would literally mean to sense owls in the marshes. So this would be to suspect something uh, is going on. Uh, to smell a rat, I guess, would be a good English equivalent. And uh, the other phrase that comes to mind is one from uh, from German, which is Oil um, nach Athen tragen, to carry owls to, uh, to Athens, which is also a funny one because it means you're doing something unnecessary since uh, Athena was uh, associated, among other things, with, with owls. So the mushroom is also a tricky one. In English, it is most likely borrowed from the old French messeron, uh, potentially borrowed from a late Latin word meaning fungus, uh, musirio, but this is um, a bit unclear. However, we do have other variants as well. Uh, so we have in Swedish svamp, in Norwegian sop, svepur in Icelandic. And um, since we have so much diversity with regard to this term, uh, there is quite the possibility that we are not dealing with an Indo-European word. The German term uh, pilz, this actually comes from the Latin boletus and it designates an edible, very common uh, type of mushroom, which is the uh, penny bun in, uh, in English. I really like the Dutch term for that, padenstool. 
brilliant uh, toadstool, <laughs> essentially. And uh, I do believe that there are also uh, some some dialectal forms in uh, in English with uh, the exact same word. Rain, Regen in German, Regen in Swedish, uh, Rhein in Norwegian, Regen in Dutch. Erigning in Icelandic and so on. An easy word, potential Proto-European root meaning moist. However, the connection is a bit unclear here. Uh, for example, we have in Latin uh, the verb irrigare, but that's quite uncertain. However, the word in itself is quite easy. Wind essentially just had some diversity in pronunciation with the variants uh, wind or windur. Other than that, no big deal. Uh, it comes from a root meaning air in motion and there is also a verb related to that uh, winda and a potential proto-indo-european word meaning to uh, blow compare for this with words such as ventus in latin and now we have reached a more difficult term which is uh, mist or fog the word can also be found in old english so mist and um, icelandic also has it uh, mister as well as swedish and uh, norwegian but i suppose the other variants are more common now and uh, the word in itself seems to have had a lot of cognates uh, compare for this with the russian mugla lithuanian migla and uh, so on the word fog seems to have been a scandinavian borrowing um, we do have some words in Icelandic that would suggest that. Uh, fork meaning drift or snow drift, as well as the verb uh, to blow, fjuka. Other terms include torka in Norwegian or tour in Danish, as well as thorka in, uh, in Icelandic. And this would seem to have been the other way around, uh, borrowing from Old English, because in Old English you can find the verb jathuxian, uh, which essentially means to get dark. And then we have the Swedish word dimma, which uh, seems to come from a Proto-Indo-European word uh, dimas, uh, root meaning gloomy, and uh, in Icelandic it actually means uh, dark or darkness. There is also a place called uh, Dimu Borgir in northern Iceland, the dark fortresses. Uh, these are fantastic lava formations, and uh, there is also the black metal band that took uh, its name precisely from these places. And then we have the term in German as well as Dutch, uh, so Nebel, and this would be the same word as the Latin Nebula, Nefele in Greek, coming from a root meaning cloud or mist. And we are only left with three pieces of clothing for this list. The first one would be the pullover or jumper or sweater, yeah, depending on the uh, on the English you're uh, using. But it's the same word that we use in German, for example, it's pullover, you just say pulley, actually. And then there is also a term borrowed from Middle Low German, which is now in Swedish in the form of Treja or Treje in uh, Danish or Trui in, uh, uh, in Dutch. Very interesting is the word Genser in Norwegian because it is actually from Gansi, a seaman's knitted sweater and it actually stems from this island, this uh, uh, island in the, uh, in the English Channel where there was a very prosperous knitting industry in the 15th uh, century and the same word was borrowed into, Eng into Irish, into Gaelic, uh, Manx as well as Norwegian. But the word in itself seems to have had Old Norse origin, meaning something like uh, the green island, perhaps. So this, the second part of the word definitely means uh, island. The first part of the word uh, probably means um, green. So it's definitely interesting to see how all these languages and cultures um, uh, interacted. And uh, then we have the Icelandic term Pesa. And to be frank, I'm not really sure where this word is coming from. Uh, there is a story which rather sounds like folk uh, etymology, but the story says that essentially a uh, French fisherman saw this uh, Icelandic farmer and starting, started shouting at him, Paisan. So uh, borrowing from, from French, but like I said, I'm not really that convinced it was the case. Nevertheless, cool story. 
And there are various ways to say uh, coat. In Swedish, for example, we have kappa. This is uh, directly from Latin, so cloak. And then we have the word, well, jacket, jas in Dutch or uh, jaki in, uh, uh, in Icelandic. So this would be a borrowing from uh, French. But here we have two words, actually, uh, jaquet, probably referring to the quilted tunic the French peasants would wear, but it can also refer to Jacques, which would have been a quilted tunic often uh, used in a defensive uh, manner in the 14th century. And uh, the term itself, coat, comes from a Latin word as well, uh, cotta, and um, you have here a root, a Proto-Indo-European root meaning uh, woolen clothes. German with mantel preferred to borrow the word from uh, the Latin mantellum. And in uh, Norwegian and um, uh, Danish frack, you can also say Koppe, by the way, so the same as the Swedish one. This would be a borrowing from the English frack, which would have had a very specific meaning of jersey or outer garment. There is also an old Germanic word meaning robe or skirt. See for that, as a terms of comparison, the German word uh, rock, which now means skirt, but the older meaning would have been garment, uh, generally speaking. So you can see how these meanings change over time. And we have reached the final word from the autumn list, and that is umbrella. In English, it is a borrowing from Latin, umbra meaning shade. And the other languages, most of them uh, preferred to borrow the term from French. So parapluie uh, essentially means against the rain in French. Two languages were a little bit more creative here. Regenschirm in German means uh, a shield against rain and Regenschirm in Icelandic means a coverage for rain. If you've reached the end of the video, you're probably curious about other seasons in Germanic languages and a little bit of etymology as well. So I do have a video about the other seasons as well. Check it out if you're interested. Other than that, um, there are other topics in the series Germanic Languages Compared. If you have a proposal yourself, please write it in the comments. And if you enjoyed the video, subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching or listening and till next time.